Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and we're here for episode 34. And with us today, our first in-person live guest with Michael Brendan Doherty. Michael, how are you today? Very good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's great. So Michael is a senior writer at National Review, and um, the genesis of this get-together with the three of us is that Michael uh, posed a tweet uh, over the weekend about um, Hungary and Rod and saying, I wonder if if Hungary will become a place where um, uh, conservatives uh, uh, you know, retreat to, uh, given all of our current madness. And uh, I said, well, hey, why don't you come on the show? And then Rod picked up the tweet and said, yeah, let's do it. And so then I, I think you felt guilty at that point that you probably <laughs> should do it. So so thank you, Rod, for laying on the guilt. And, and Michael, thank you for coming. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about Hungary. Rod, you, know, you just uh, got profiled in The New Yorker, right? And part of that story was... Was your your um, was it an infatuation with with Hungary? How was no, it characterized? It's, it's the whole story. The, the, the yeah. title or the headline was something like "What does Rod Dreher see in Hungary? Why are American conservatives, certain American conservatives, so fascinated by Viktor Orban in Hungary?" Yeah. And they sent a reporter down here to the Bayou to um, to ask me about it. And uh, he was actually Ben Wallace Wells is his name. He was a good guy. He was straightforward with me and said, "Listen, I'm." I'm a liberal, but I'll treat you fairly. And he had done uh, stories previously on Christopher Rufo and Sora Bamari, and right. those were fair. So um, I agreed to meet him, and poor guy came to Louisiana and caught COVID down here, even though did he, he really? was vaccinated. Yeah, he did, did he really? He did. Wait, he did. another breakthrough case? I'm shocked. Yeah, I'm shocked. yeah. And, and that, but that's why the story was delayed coming out. But Got it. anyway, so yeah, it appeared in the in the paper. It was kind of a, a conservatives in the mist story. But I think it, I think it really <laughs> is actually a good story because – um, there are conservatives, not all conservatives, just a certain kind of conservative, people like me, people like I, Michael, I would, uh, I believe, who do find Hungary interesting. And it's not because we want to rep- we want to repeat the Orban government here in the United States. I don't mm-hmm. think that's possible. But there's mm-hmm. some really interesting aspects about the Hungarian right and more broadly, the European right, the non-establishment mm-hmm. right that I think American conservatives really ought to be paying attention to. So, Michael, you know, you're you're um, a conservative here in the United States. You write for, you know, arguably the sort of the kind of the the OG publication yeah. when it comes to uh, American conservatism. Of course, the fusion is bent. I mean, uh, but I know that these things are all in flux and, and, and up for grabs, it would seem. It seems like uh, conservatives are finally sort of having their what's going to come after sort of Reagan fusionism uh now so so what's your take on all this as you watch all this unfold and are part of it on some level um well it's a you know what comes after is a big topic i mean a lot of times it's what what comes before i mean Mm. in in a sense that um the republican party was not always you know what buckley and and the conservative movement were making of it in the 1950s and you know what you're seeing I think a little bit in America is, you know, a return of, you know, the older traditions in the Republican Mm -hmm. party that go back to Teddy Roosevelt, even Lincoln, um, where there is a a more nationalist um, bent to things and a a more, um, you know, aggressive approach to getting public goals out of market activity rather than just letting the market decide what your society's Mm -hmm. goals are. so there's a little bit of that. And the reason I I think I'm curious about Hungary, uh, and I mean, I went there a few years ago, mm. you know, one of these things where, it, you know, John O'Sullivan invites you and you go. <laughs> you go. Uh, and that, that, that's what happens, right? Yeah. You go and to me. Mm. And you, you know, um, I met with lots of, you know, big wigs in Fidesz mm. and... Um, they were impressive and they were in, interesting on two levels. One, it was interesting to um, hear them talk about the economic things they did uh, mm-hmm. after they came into power, mm-hmm. where, um, you know, Hungary sort of was in danger of going totally prostrate economically as it entered the EU mm-hmm. and kind of, I think, was shocked to find itself not the breadbasket of Europe, like literally as in German bread was being imported into Hungary onto their shelves, which when Hungary was led by a left-wing government at this time in the 2000s. Yeah. And so it, 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 um, 
so I was interested in that aspect. And then also, of course, I'm interested in um, what really enrages people about Viktor Orban is that he is politically uh, muffling or countering this access that we're dealing with in America all the time, this access between uh, nonprofit, non-governmental organizations, the academy, and the media. Right. Um, and and the judiciary uh, with them, um, which is, you know, sort of a, a, a complex of institutions that I think genuinely abscond issues from democratic input, particularly social issues, mm -hmm. um, and impose progressive ideas. Um, not everything he does can be applied in the United States. Not everything he does he he does should be mm -hmm. applied in the United States. And I might feel really uncomfortable with some of the things sure. he's done. But anyway, it is just interesting to watch this experiment in real time. And just in in National Review's history, um, I know there's some that deplore this, but like Buckley was always interested in what was happening on the anti-communist right in Europe, mm -hmm. even when it wasn't you know, a kind of small L liberal uh, conservatism. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remain interested. I'm, I am, however, I'll just, I'll like wrap this up with my, yeah. my skepticism, which is my skepticism about Hungary is less the, um, you know, the things Ben Benjamin Wallace Wells brought up in his profile, like, oh, they didn't fund a program that would do something for the Roma. Well, it's like, it's not, that's not necessarily persecution. Um <laughs> And in fact, there 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 was a Roma uh, minister of the European Parliament for Fidesz. Um, they uh, and and Fidesz has tried to, you know, make reach out to Jews and Roma in Hungary and kind of say like we're going to protect you from Islamic um, settlement uh, right. and what that would mean for you here. Uh, so that doesn't bother me as much what bothers me and, and this applies just as much to poland as well which also has a kind of conservative populist yeah. government what bothers me is or, or makes me doubtful is that um the birth rates remain so low yeah right and and i know they're both governments have tried to address this and they and they've only made you know i think modest upward movement toward replacement level but I guess the thing that most profoundly influenced the way I look at the world now is Mary Eberstadt's book, How the West Really Lost yeah. God. Yeah. And she kind Under, of- Underrated book. It's a really underrated her book. Tale. She's it, 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 it absolutely was like the, the kind of spark that kicked off my own book in a way. Hmm. Um, and um, I stupidly didn't mention her in the, in the, in the final section, <laughs> but uh Anyway, she kind of posits in this book that what you see is when there's a big fertility drop, that's um, the leading indicator of secularization and, and progressive uh, social change, not the lagging indicator. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and so, I, so I, I expect that, and, and Hungary is already not a, a super religious country. Yeah, Rod, Rod right? makes that point quite a bit. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it, you know, it, although it has a religious <laughs> identity, um, but is it but, a, a but lack Poland, of Poland? I think Poland is 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 like on the cusp of going through what Ireland and mm. Quebec before it went through, which is like mm. a massive, you know, discovery of you know secrets and shames in yeah. Yeah. Uh, the time when the Catholic Church was preeminent socially. Well, yeah. I can tell you that's true, and I've said on this podcast many times that I was told that by young, observant, conservative Catholics in Poland that. That we're about ten years away from Ireland being Ireland. Yeah, I mean, which, which it, means I mean, it's probably quicker than that, as we we've, we've learned. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of gradually and then suddenly. And I, yeah. I, I would I would keep bet that it's going to be more sudden than we think. Well, see, <clears> to, <throat> to speak to Michael's point about the birth rate, he's right about that. Um, Orban has not been able to get the birth rate up. Uh, I I talked a few years ago to an American academic who had just finished a study for the European Union. They wanted they they hired him to see if it was possible to get the birth rate up without a religious rebirth. 
And he told me that the EU was not happy with his result. He went back to him and said, there's no, we have no reason to believe that this could be done without a religious resurgence. Now, Orban, I, I've heard him say, I, I was with him in a session that he spent like a couple of years ago with some, some of us who had gone over to speak at a religious liberty conference. He seems to understand whether he's sincere or not. He certainly understands that there will be no uh, protecting Hungary, there will be no protecting Europe without a uh, uh, without the birth rate turning around, and that requires religious rebirth. Now, he has said really, uh, this is so interesting, because I wonder what the integralists would say about it. You know, he said, look, I'm a politician. I can give you things, but I can't give you meaning. Well, and I what am. he seems to be doing is... Um, trying to arrange, use political power to arrange society in such a way that the church and others, um, you know, uh, other inst civil institutions, civic institutions can do the work it needs to do. But I, I don't think Orban believes on his own that political power in exercising political power is the way to save the country, but at least it's something. Mm. And that's, this is what I, I, I admire about him. It's like, He's a guy who's, who understands that we're going through a civilizational crisis. This isn't just a passing political thing. This is about the future of the West. Mm -hmm. And he, and I don't know enough about the polls to say for sure, but Orban is certainly the uh, one of the only uh, Western leaders who gets this, and he's willing to fight for it. He might be fighting a losing battle, but the rest of yeah. Europe seems to have been completely surrendered to the idea that there's nothing there worth saving. Yeah, no, it, it's it is difficult too. And you know, I'm I, the other thing I'm interested in. And this is going to be my really heterodox Orban opinion. My really heterodox Orban opinion is that I think the financial corruption might be good statecraft. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Henry the Eighth. Uh, as wicked as he was by creating a native wealthy mm -hmm. class of people yeah. was able to drastically enhance um, the prestige of the English crown. Well, and, and, so. and, 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 and it's and, precisely what his daughter um, used to not only solidify, you know, um, uh, English Protestantism, you know, st state church, um, but really solidified the power of the crown. I mean, it was really, I think he sort of set that in motion. Yeah, I mean, what Hungary needs uh, <laughs> is, and this can this could totally backfire in, in the way I think it has backfired in, in Russia, but Hungary needs rich Hungarians. Uh, <laughs> and it needs extremely wealthy Hungarians who can fund businesses, who can start industries in Hungary. Um, and if redirecting some of the eu funds begins creating that uh class of people yeah of course it's corrupt in its way it's totally nepotistic it seems like in practice but um it's one way not to get pushed around you know like uh you know for instance the orban government kind of got pushed by german automakers on its labor laws and then when it reformed its labor laws to allow more overtime then the German government then bullied them about like, oh, you've instituted a slave law. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, this is something you can avoid if you're more economically uh, muscular. And in Hungary's case, that means not just uh, letting rich outsiders uh, monopolize your country's resources. Well, that's um, precisely what, what Orban did when he came in. I don't know how much you were told about this, Michael, but when I first went there and I was I was concerned, my first question when this was in 2019, when I first went to the country, yeah. was oh, this crony capitalism. Like, yeah. why is the Orban government allowing, you know, all, all these these this oligarch class to arise? And um, the answer I got was really interesting. They said that when Orban came to power in 2010, you know, following this disastrous uh, left wing government, uh, Orban realized how, as you say, prostrate the the country was to foreign owners. Now, the thing that most that you don't really understand about Hungary until you've been there is how much sovereignty means to these people, because they've been trampled for so long by being subject to outsiders. 
Orban saw the fact that most of the country's industry was owned by foreigners uh, as a threat to the sovereignty of the country. So he yeah. repatriated it. And uh, my friend and, and your friend, uh, uh, Anna, who told me about this, she said, you know, it, it's not ideal that Orban's friends are uh, this, uh, own these companies. He said, but at least that's something we can deal with in our own parliament if we choose to. If the ownership of these companies was outside our country, we had no control over it. And that meant they had more foreigners had more say over the destiny of Hungary than we do. Well, and in, in seen in that light, it makes sense to me. And it's just not a justification for mm -hmm. what he's doing, but it's an explanation for it that makes it seem uh, uh, much less onerous. Well, yeah. And when, when I look over at like Ireland, which went from, you know, a a relatively poor European country to now a relatively rich one, mm -hmm. you know, there has been a price as far, far as, you know, they pursued foreign direct investment. And now like Google, Apple, and Facebook are hugely powerful. Um, and the, um, and not neutral, right? I mean, I think that's what we, we, we pretend, we pretend this sort of magic world of, of neutrality. Yeah. Yeah. Hardly neutral. And, and now the, the, um, it's really hard for native Irish entrepreneurs to do any kind of business in Ireland. Um, the hurdles for them are much higher <clears throat> than the hurdles for American multinationals. And, uh, and that's, that is a serious problem and it has to be resolved. I do wonder if they're going to resolve it by, you know, if they obey what the European Union wants, uh, Ireland will lose its tax sovereignty and those businesses will probably begin migrating to France and yeah. Germany. Yeah. Um, so they're in a, they're in a tough spot, but that's why you want, um, if you, especially when you're in the European union, you really need some economic muscle of your own to pull weight. Otherwise you are subject, um, to whatever's going on in Belgium. Yeah. Um, and so, and so anyway, I, I find for all those reasons, I find him very interesting. Uh, but I'm also, you know, just where, just looking at the political situation, it looks like he's in jeopardy in his next election, and um, I think the same is going to is probably true of Poland's law and justice. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm worried that these are like last <clears throat> gasps, rather than um, you know a, a kind of new beginning. Uh, so, so that's kind of haunted my mind um, when I, when well, I here, think about. Here's the thing, and I think this is the heart of it, Michael. I'd love to know what you think about this. Orban's, uh, Orban is a dark mirror of liberalism in, in a particular sense. Like whenever I, I would hear the liberals complain about what he's done to the universities, which is much yeah, yeah. less bad than they claim, but it's, it's not, it's a kind of thing that in the past <laughs> would have caused me to go like, oh, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just all he's doing is exactly what the left is doing outside the government in the U.S. in terms of manipulating the uh, the what what can be taught in the courses um, for the sake of a political goal. Now, Orban has just barely touched it. The left in the U.S. is radically overhauling it, but it's the same thing. And all Orban is doing, it seems to me, on any number of fronts, is is using the power of the political sphere to keep a space open for non-leftist uh, thought and, and discourse. He very controversially, controversially earlier this year transferred uh, completely legally uh, a bunch of state funds to semi-private organizations that oversee a, a certain numbers of universities and the uh, MCC, Matthias Kovinas Collegium. Now the, the Hungarian left scream bloody murder about this and you know all things being equal i would have too why is he taking state money and putting it into these private things what he's doing it seems to me is building a conservative deep state hmm. and uh, because yeah. the left in hungary uh completely dominates the standard institutions of civil society and what orban is trying to do as i see it is make sure that the the traditional right does not get crushed and this is why I think he's interesting, because even though it is illiberal what he's doing, he is responding to the way the left, the institutional left in, in, the, in Europe more broadly and in America, is 
using liberal democracy and the institutions and the procedures of liberal democracy to institute illiberal leftism. Yeah. So, you know, I think this gives me two questions that I want you all to, so maybe we can chew on this out loud here. But um, you know, that's, what I think, getting back to what Michael's talking about with statecraft, right? You know, there's this, there's this, you know, extra adjacent government uh, uh, activities and, and entities that, that build out statecraft. And if you've spent, you know, five minutes in Washington, D.C., you know exactly that, you know, what goes on in Washington is not just the, the sort of the two buildings there, but it's all the stuff that surrounds it and all the, oh, yeah. the money and interest and people that surround it. It's, it's huge. And so much of that uh, energy and focus and resources flows one direction. You know, and I think, you know, an outside, you know, conservative like me looks upon all this sort of stuff. And it's like it's just never a fair game because the, the, the statecraft is is so dominated by these extra governmental forces that are very well healed and all pretty progressive or left at least left minded or left oriented and then you know we talk about this word so the statecraft is one question and we talk about this word cronyism and the word cronyism of course is 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 uh, has all of the the sort of the the associative uh, understanding it's a bad word like cronyism equals bad but what, what, why do we automatically associate statecraft or, or sort of just being wily in terms of creating some sort of um, uh, movement or, or, or motion or efforts as a, as a form of cronyism when it doesn't seem that that's always it seems continually unequal in terms of its energy and direction? Mm, right, cronyism. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard because, it, you know. I don't know if anyone saw uh, Curtis Yarvin's little interview with with Tucker Carlson. Yeah, um, only only a, only a clip of it. So yeah. But he, you know, he suggested you know if you look at regimes one way, mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times is the most powerful organ of the American regime. Right. And um, I think he has a point, uh, which is that um, there is an ability of the left to coordinate across institutions and across informal networks of power and with major movers of capital like facebook and i mean yes you know, it, it and, really and, does matter and and you feel like sometimes as a conservative you feel like you're watching it in real yeah. time like yeah. you, you like i remember when i think it was indiana's religious liberty uh fight a few years ago and it was like okay here comes apple and then Apple's objection, which can be, you know, like in a way the media can then drive activism within Apple. Apple's activism drives the, the corporate board to make statements and the corporate board itself probably is inclined to make them anyway. <laughs> yeah. Then that becomes a reason to pressure the elected government in right. Indiana. Then the media in Indiana goes and searches out for Memories Pizza of course, to make like classic. A, a, a kind of yeah. uh, an example and suddenly, like, we're having a national debate about, like, some poor pizza chain in the middle of nowhere. Right. It, it, uh, it, you know, uh, the other day, and, Brett and Heather Hying on their Dark Horse podcast, he talked about this idea of the fog machine of war. And what we're talking about here yeah, yeah, in yeah. terms of in terms of government and, and, and capital and, and all this, this is the part of the fog machine. And what you just laid out, Michael, is exactly and it's all sort of vaguely or maybe even explicitly coordinated. And all of it does is it, it, it makes it very difficult to sort of see the truth. Well, yeah, and and here's the thing too. There, what we're we're talking about here is how the map is not the same thing as the territory. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take the map of liberal democracy, the right. the right. procedural democracy, right. it, somebody like Viktor Orban is clearly violating that. But if you look at the actual territory we're on, where all of these actors in the United States and in Western Europe from uh, academia, media, corporate, uh, corporate boards, even now the, the freaking military, they're all behaving in ways that are highly illiberal. Totally. But because they're all and it doesn't the, matter. It, yeah, it does. because they're all on the same page ideologically, it all looks fine. But Viktor Orban is somebody who, for all his faults, sees this and calls foul. And worse for Viktor Orban, 
he fights and fights effectively, unlike Donald Trump, who, fall, who fights like a oh bar and drunk falling off a stool. Viktor Orban is a really intelligent, focused man. No, that's, that is what's impressive about Orban is his intelligence. Um, and I'm surprised it hasn't degenerated, and maybe it will, into arrogance, um, because he, he does seem to be just a cut above. Um, you know, one of the things about that's also difficult for a country like Hungary is that talented people think oh, I could do more with my life in the United States or in London or in Frankfurt than I can do here. And that's true, not just for private uh, enterprises, but for the public enterprise mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it can lead, I think, marginal countries in the European Union to really have a more, um, uh, Remora like political class than they would otherwise have. Um, and so the eruption of an intelligent, um, you know, statesman in Europe, and, th and that's, I think, why Orban has impressed some non uh, right wing Hungarians, right? Like, um, not just, you know, because Fidesz is, is winning more than just the the committed social conservatives. Yeah, the base, the base. But he's yeah. also winning over um, a section of the middle and he's winning over, you know, there are intellectuals like, um, uh, you know, there's a left-wing intellectual, Frank Ferruti, who has some roots in Hungary, I think, and um, uh, another Marxist. novel, Tibor Fischer, um, yeah. the, no the novelist Tibor Fischer, who is himself kind of a progressive liberal, but he appreciates Orban because Orban has been good for Hungary, right? Is 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 kind of lifting Hungary but, up. But, off even, the mat. but even even that idea, right, of, of something being good for Hungary, right? I mean, even that very idea of a kind of a localist, well, yeah. a localist conception of a kind of local good is, is going to run afoul of of the sort of the internationalist sort of uh, affect of of you know the ruling the ruling party or, or whatever. You know, what do you call it, Rod? Not the not the elites, but the uh, the ruling class, the cathedral, yeah, our, our or, betters. Yeah, the yeah. people who run the cathedral. Well, you know? yeah, and and they're trying. I mean, the Hungarians are really the, the Fidesz people are really scared about this upcoming election because yeah, they you know, should the, be. Yeah, they should be. I mean, it's it, any party has been in power <clears throat> since 2010, as long as they've been, has to be afraid. But it's also the case that the the left wing opposition has finally gotten its act together. Mm -hmm. They're they're coordinating with each other. And you don't read this often in the American press. They have made an alliance, a tactical alliance with Yabik, which is an actual far right yeah, racist anti-Semitic party. party. It, it's now on the left. I mean, well, they're, they're now with the left, but you don't read that in the Atlantic or anywhere else. Well, and and and, and further, what will happen is if uh, if Fidesz is defeated, they will the the coalition government, if it can hang together, it will have a kind of implicit permission from Brussels, from the New York Times and others, to pursue aggressive constitutional reform to secure liberal power in a way that um, Orban hasn't had that, that permission and neither of the polls, even though they, you know, they ran on co constitutional reform and won and won sufficient majorities to enact it, um, they will, um, they received all sorts of fuzz from, from Brussels or from, uh, you know, other European states and from the international press. And, you know, you have to remember too, that like, unlike America, like just about every other country on earth, besides maybe China, Germany, or maybe the UK, France, like every other country on earth really cares about what American newspapers are saying about them <laughs> because America is important. America's, it moves money, right? Mm -hmm. Like if, if it, it, it's easier to, get investment in your country or even within your country when the the, the world has a decent opinion of you uh, or the the opinion of the opinion makers is good so um anyway it's a, it's it's a it's a huge challenge um although i wonder you know if 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 fidesz can survive a loss um 
uh, in the next election that is like still be an important uh, player afterward and not be subject to dismemberment in a process of constitutional reform. Right. Um, then I think I think that could even possibly be healthy, though. I mean, I because I, I think it would be. Um, I'm, well, who am I kidding? No one's going to say that. Oh well, they 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 took a good loss and now they came back and won later. It'll still be a, a panic. Um, well, yeah, they, and it's it's just this larger problem I think we are facing where, um, like a kind of crisis developing I think across the Western world of genuinely populist conservatives. If they win elections, it's a crisis for democracy. <laughs> And when we lose elections, uh, populist conservatives see a kind of crisis of legitimacy. And they say, like, well, the, the whole system is stacked and it's unfair. Um, are, you, are you thinking here of California or, or just out of well, curiosity? Just, or? Yeah, a little bit of California. But um, although I think because Elder, uh, Larry Elder, did concede graciously and, and had no, no basis at all for yeah, yeah. testing. Um, but, um, you just do see this, this larger disaffection from the idea of shared system, you know, that there is real, mm, that there's going to be, I, I just think we see across the West, like a real, um, you saw it so much within Brexit too. Right. I, I but that's that, what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. And that was what made such an impression on me. And you mm. saw it with Donald Trump. You see yeah. it with Fidesz. Uh, you see this disaffection of a shared system. Like if you win, it's intolerable and corrupt and uh, I can't stand the way you exercise power. It's illegitimate in some fundamental way. And if we all really feel that way, that's a problem. I mean, that's, that's like a big problem. Well, well, there's no, there's no body politic and there's no trust with which but, to build a community. But this is the thing that just kills me about the left is that all of these policies they're pursuing, especially about race in our country, it's designed to tear the body politic apart, to dismember it for the sake of power. I mean, the um, it's it's unbelievable what what they're trying to do and what they're not trying to do, what they're doing. Well, what do you think it's going to end? I don't know. I mean, you see, it, it's interesting, right? Because that now there's a line developing on the left of like, oh, the opposition to uh, critical race theory in public schools is led by schools that are heavily diverse racially. And it's like, yeah, no shit. And if you look <laughs> at the numbers, it's um, uh, critical race theory is unpopular among blacks. Right. Um, right. It's, a, it's a minority position among blacks. It's Critical race theory is more popular in lily white oh, suburbs yeah. that have already excluded blacks and yeah. in um, private schools that have largely excluded the majority of uh, racial minorities because it, the game there is sort of, um, it's like entirely spiritualized. It's totally. like, okay, yes, I'm a totally guilty white person, right. Right. but it has no effect because I really don't have to have comedy with, you know, a 30% of the student population. Well, cause I can do the work quote unquote while sipping right. my latte. I mean, like that's, that's just the truth of it. And so, uh, I, so I, I don't know, I don't know where it goes. Um, but well, look, this is the thing I talked about in the New Yorker piece. You know, I, I uh, came across as apocalyptic because I am apocalyptic. You are apocalyptic. <laughs> but I am apocalyptic, yeah. of course. Um, it's but, why we love you, Rod. It's why we love no, you. But honestly, I think the freaking house is on fire and nobody wants to see it. Nobody wants to talk about it. When I was in Hungary last, I met this woman uh, about my age, mid 50s. She was really, really sad because her 19 year old son had asked her, Hey, mom, did you ever kiss a girl? You know, and you could see me asking my mom that. She'd yeah. slap me. But, but uh, she was offended. And he said, don't be offended. Everybody in my generation, we're all experimenting, uh, same-sex experimenting. And, mm -hmm. and she went on to say that my son, for at least three years, the only media he, he listens to or watches is English language media. So yeah. she said that the, the, uh, the internet and has been a, for her, just this pipeline to the corruption of her kids and, and that generation. And 
I heard the same thing in Poland uh, too. And you know, we can't. We're not going to turn back the internet, but um, this is the thing that I don't know how it gets defeated when when the enemy holds all the propaganda and uh, and is forming the propaganda resources and is forming the imagination of the next generation. Um, you know, that's the thing that makes me believe that what Orban is doing is like the like the, the, the last Byzantine emperor standing on the walls of Constantinople mm. as the uh, Islamic hordes are about to take over. Right. But, you know, there's I guess I don't know. Maybe I should be more apocalyptic. Maybe I am sometimes. Um, again, because I think, you know, our social fabric is really frayed and if it if it were to come under stress so say like you know I, it, you know finance and economics are not really my uh my thing but if the united states went through um a period like the russians did in the 1990s where you had like a noticeable drop in living standards mm-hmm. and we're and, and and one you couldn't paper over right. with what I think we have been papering over it with, which is um, uh, skimming off of posterity by literally not conceiving more children and by pushing debt obligations yeah. further and further into the future. Um, yeah, I mean, we've know, lost the, the, the idea of a shared sacrifice. I mean, would, there's would, no governmental sacrifice. Would, uh, you know, would there be a kind of, uh, like, how much worse would our politics get if there were, like, a, just a, you know, like, if there were inflation for a decade that lowered living standards in a, yeah. in a noticeable way? Um, you know, I don't know how well we would cope with that. I, you know, I think my, my grandparents' generation could have coped with that. I think that many of them did in the 1970s right. uh, cope with something like that. Uh, where, you know, if you didn't own a home in the 70s, like you're, you probably dropped a few socioeconomic runs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, on the other hand, I also think, you know, progressives themselves don't seem happy, right? Like I, it just like the, our elite, like the the people who are kind of on board um, with where society is going, they seem like unhappy and stressed out and fearful of losing status quickly. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem like a merry uh, band of, of people who are satisfied with triumph. Uh, did, but you know. did the Bolsheviks? I mean, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, I guess they. Yeah, you're 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 correct. They were, no, but, they but were at awesome. least they believed in. It, it, say what you will, Bolshevism was an ethos. It had ethos. Yeah. Right. Well, they, but, they, but they did believe that like happiness was coming, right? Like, right. Right. There actually is no like um, ontology. The the, the, pro- the progressive social vision now is just kind of like, well, we're kind of like on the cusp of um, this thing that will make it better, but not terribly different. Um, well, I mean, as an illustration, Michael, I mean, can you ever imagine, I mean, let's just, can you ever imagine Bernie Sanders actually being happy? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of joking, well, but I'm actually being kind of serious. I don't know. I, I kind of, I, like I don't happy. Know. I mean, happy, like imagine if, like, you know, he get he gets whatever legislative initiative that, 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 that he wants. Like, can you imagine that man being well, he's like, Larry, happy? He's Larry David. Come on. I mean, well, I'm, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. kind of what I mean. I mean, I don't think that happiness is sort of figured into the equation. No, but, but I, I, I think that what, what the young left, especially the, the Gen Z people and mm-hmm. some of the younger millennials, I don't think that what they're pursuing is happiness. I think what they're pursuing is this frantic search for meaning that make that, that that tamps down their anxieties that they can redirect it to the enemy, whether the enemy is uh, homophobia or ra- white supremacy, whatever. As long as they can stay focused on an enemy and blame this enemy for all the anxiety and all the things that trouble them, I think that's what they're they're after. But it is inherently unstable because there, as as we said, Michael, there is no ultimate 
telos here for these people. And this, right. I think, is is the problem, you know, one of the, the end of liberal democracy in a way, where it becomes totally decadent, because liberal democracy works well when it serves a people who has a different telos, something that can't, some sense of ultimate truth that can't be determined by democratic vote. I mean, this is the the reason that Jane, uh, uh, John Adams said famously that our constitution is made for moral and religious people. Well, we've lost that, that we've lost our religion. We've lost any kind of sense of shared transcendence. And all we have now is power. And I don't think that the left conceives of it in those terms, but I think that's what we're seeing. And, you know, when it, in what we're all down to now, the whole fight about Viktor Orban, I think, is ultimately an argument about whether the purpose of, uh, of a liberal democracy is itself to serve itself mm -hmm. or the purpose is to create uh, conditions for virtue. And, uh, and the two clearly can't, uh, can't exist together in, in the system, the, the, this impasse that we've come to. And Orban believes, uh, and he said this, he says, I believe in an illiberal democracy. And what he means by that is he believes in Christian democracy. He's explained that he thinks that the, broadly speaking, the Christian religion is the foundation for state and society. And he believes that politics ought to, again, broadly favor uh, what Christianity proclaims as true. I mean, he's a Calvinist himself. The Calvinists are 25% of Hungary. The Catholics are like 43%. But, um, you know, he, he actually believes in this stuff. And well, yeah. I loved it when he went to Pope Francis when they saw each other last week in Budapest and handed him this letter from a medieval king, uh, King Bela IV, inviting the Pope at the time to don't, you know, do, don't let Christian Europe go away. And Fran and uh, Orban clearly believes, and I agree with him, that Pope Francis could not give a rip, less of a rip about Christian Europe. Yeah, it's it's what's troubling about, you know, where Christianity sits in the West is that for, so say my, for my parents' generation, literally for my father, um, they were given enough of this by the culture around them or by their parents mm -hmm. that it was always their religion, even when they stopped believing yeah. and practicing it. Yeah. It was on board. My parents. Yeah. It, it, was, it was unconsciously unboarded, uh, onboarded right. for them. And, and it remained like the idea of like, okay, if I ever needed to become religious, I, got I know where to go <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I know yeah. where to begin and I know how to like put that back into my life. Um, but now for like a huge, I, I would say, you know, a majority of say my, like my kids classmates, uh, if they're in the public school, like they have no formation in this at all, um, except the very like deep background of the West right? Like there is still in the stories we tell, like in the pattern of Western storytelling, sure. uh, you know, there's still like this thing that causes Westerners to um, look at victims as victims and not as just the pathetic losers. Or Well, that, yeah, but that, as, as or, Holland, I mean, as Tom Holland points out that that is in fact latent Christianity, like that yes. doesn't exist beyond it or outside of that. Um, so, or as Pajot would say, right? Jonathan Pajot would say that 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 the story is inevitable. Like religion well, it, is inevitable. That's it, what I think he means. We still have like literally like the the um, the way we build human settlement in the yeah. West reflects a kind of Christian anthropology yeah. in the way it's sociable to each other. Whereas you can see, like in the Islamic world, things are built, uh, you know, much more uh, veiled and hidden and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's, there's all sorts of like deep Christianity still in the West and, and those impulses though, uh, inform all, some of the quixotic moral crusades that we see from the left too. I, you know, I still, I, I guess I still kind of agree with Chesterton that it's the virtues have been unbundled from each other and, and allowed to run mad. Uh, apart yeah, it's good image. Uh, in, in different directions um so I, I don't know where it goes but i i'm you know i'll be watching central europe with curiosity but i i'm i'm sort of i find myself almost like 
hiding my eyes because I, I fear <laughs> well, what the next decade is going to bring. Well, I, and I think you're right, too. But we, we started this conversation by with, yeah. thinking about your tweet. Like, do conservatives go, you know, run to uh, Budapest as like the lost generation did to Paris in the 20s? Or maybe more seriously, should cons- could, you know, Christian or social conservatives in the West look to Hungary as a refuge? And uh, believe it or not, when I was over there, I heard, I never met any of them, but I heard reliably of some people, especially from Belgium and the Netherlands, but also some from Paris who have relocated to Hungary uh, out of, uh, because I I think it's going to be safer in the long run. They don't believe that their own countries, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, will be able to stop the violence that they believe is coming from uh, uh, unassimilated Muslim immigrants. But I I think that, you know, it's attractive to think that we have a place we can go. And I think it's certainly true that Budapest is becoming an intellectual center for um, the sort of conservatism that would not be be welcome at the Heritage Foundation or the the usual institutions Mm -hmm. on the American right. And I think that's all to the good. There's a real culture developing there. But we can't, we shouldn't lie to ourselves. I mean, the yeah. Hungarian is an incredibly difficult language to learn. Nobody's, if you go to Hungary seeking um, refuge, you know, you're going to have to live in an English language foreign bubble. Right. And uh, right. it's right. also right. the case, true, as we talked about at the beginning, Hungary is just not a religious country. And, you know, that our my friend and Michael's uh, Anna has told me several times. She thinks that when I look at, she says, when I look at my generation, she's 35. She goes, I see people who basically want to turn this country into Magyar Sweden. Mm. And uh, mm-hmm. ultimately politics is downstream from culture. And that's what makes me very uh, worried about the future of Hungary and all but, the Visegrad nations. Uh, but you know, the, the gift, I mean, <laughs> to almost be pagan about, uh, the, my my political imagination is that the gift uh, or the, or the terror of politics and like kind of systems or epic epics passing from one to the next is that um, we're still human, right? And and so we're flawed, and we are sinful, and so this dispensation that we're living under now. Mm-hmm will over time accumulate all of the reputation for injustice, uh, hypocrisy, high-handedness, and arrogance that um, Christian civilization suffered, you know, suffered under those, um, that reputation. And so, you know, in a way, like, the, the shit that our civilization produces will fertilize some kind of um, movement against it, right? Some kind of growth of something else. Uh, so, like, I, I guess that's sort of like my deep view of like, okay, if people are unhappy with uh, low fertility societies, and I think they will be, because I think they're going to be so marked by loneliness, dislocation, and atomization. You know, that and will the, begin causing people to think, oh, maybe we're not living in a way that's consonant with our nature. Mm-hmm. And so where, what can we turn to to justify uh, a movement back towards uh, living in a way that's more social uh, on, uh, and more human? Do you ever so read this it, book called The Benedict Option? <laughs> you ever hear about that? What is that? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not familiar. No, with but that, that. that's just what I was talking about in the Benedict Option, though. And uh, the problem with that is, I mean, this is the best hope I could come up with, the best I could. And, and I think you're right, that there will be people who look around at this, this decadence and corruption and think there's got to be a better way. Um, so my greatest hope is that we can at least create the structures that can uh, protect the seeds and get them across this this dark period of time to the to the springtime in the future, which will probably be many years after I've I've died. Um, but that that's the thing that concerns me, though, is that we're gonna if, if we lose our children to the faith, then it, it's we're done. We're done, and that's the thing that that is beyond yeah. politics. Politics has something to say about that. Um, I mean, it matters more to have uh, people running the, the regime 
that don't hate uh, traditional Christians, that don't hate the Latin mass and things like that than people who do. But ultimately, we're not going to be we're not going to vote our way out of this. And if we can't we I'm talking about people like you guys, me and people we know, we can't figure out how to make the faith live in the hearts of our children and help them help make it live so intensely that they're willing to uh, accept being marginalized in this post-Christian, anti-Christian society, then um, we're done. I mean, look, it, ma- it doesn't matter to me so much that my kids live in a liberal democracy. What matters to me is that they've kept the faith. Yeah. And I think, I bet the two of you would agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to build it out. I mean, you talk about this with the Benders, Rod. I mean, you know, that, that being surrounded by all of this, like you just have to, you really do have to take care of it at the, the, <laughs> the ultra local level, which is your family. And you kind of have to build it out from there. I mean, but the, the, I, I think what we, I guess, you know, I don't want to like, not re, I'm not used to talking this way, but I think what we have like going for us or on our side is that, I mean, we do have this just incredible repository of tradition. Like it's there, like it, it, and they can, and they can try to blanket on the internet or whatever, but like, you know, the entire corpus of the Western tradition sort of holds all of these tensions. It holds all of this sort of rich soil. And, and, you know, and, and, and it's still like, you know, we just got finished before you got on, Michael, we were talking a little bit about Dante because I'm, I'm teaching Dante right now. Like Dante still works. I mean, it's literally, you know, 700 years since he passed away and I'm in there doing cantos one and two with my kids 45 minutes ago, my, my students. And like, it's still damn compelling. You know, it's all yeah. right there. And so I do take some comfort in the fact that, you know, you have places like this one and other schools that are trying even, you know, we're, this is not going to win, you know, the 2024 election cycle, but or the 2022 election cycle, but it is sort of planting these seeds in kids and I can see it in their faces. I mean, they do, they respond to this. You know, the problem is that there's so much noise, right? There's so much noise with their online lives and social media and the internet and all that sort of stuff. But like Dante still kind of works. I, I was just out in uh, California recording something for Prager U, uh, something about live not by lies. And I was talking with some of the people who work for Dennis Prager out there about the work they do. And they see it as a primarily a cultural uh, yeah. thing, cultural and academic. And uh, I said, where are the rich conservatives? Why do they keep giving money to the Republican Party and not to things like this? There's so many initiatives. I mean, Prager U is well funded oh, by yeah. donors. But what's that? Oh, I know. I just I think about this all the time. Yeah, they're not they're all these classical uh, Christian educational programs that are out there. There's so many small initiatives being done by people who want to save the culture, want to save our traditions. Where are the rich Republicans? They're throwing money behind Turning Point USA and crap like that. Yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, I think. I do think one thing, I mean, again, you know, maybe this explains some of the attitude uh, difference is I, I am, I believe in the God of the Psalms. I believe in the God of the Bible. And so I have faith that whatever is coming um is part of this larger plan of salvation for humanity Mm -hmm. and that even uh like it would it would destroy my heart right to see my kids give up the faith or uh, worse to repudiate it in a kind of specific way and yet i've already kind of like meditated on that possibility for a long time Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of surrendered to the idea that God's spirit has to move in their heart for them to come to faith. Like yeah. at, at some point, like, you know, I can do what I'm called to do. Mm-hmm. But the one thing in Christianity is there still is this idea of the individual and the individual soul yeah. in it. Um, and so as much community as I can build around them, I will build it. Uh, but there is still this, you know, heart to heart thing between God and his creation. Well, like, like the three of us. I mean, at some point, the three of us, I mean, I, I can tell you my biography. I'm sure you can tell yours. I mean, at some point, like I assented to the thing, like you know, my parents yeah. had sort of, you know, 
created this garden, or if you, if, that, if you want that metaphor. And, and at some point, I had to say, okay, I'll take the cup. Right. And, and to mix know, my and, metaphors. Yeah. And maybe it's also because I'm kind of coming from a family where, you know, my grandparents were kind of faithful Catholics, not in like some extraordinary way, but, the, but like you know, the regular way that people just laity the reg- were, yeah. yeah, just the regular way of like, you know, uh, keeping <laughs> up the, with the sacraments, do the things, uh, do the pray, things. That's right. Praying when they're under stress mm-hmm. um, and, and making sure you got a Catholic education. Um, and, you know, and then my parents' generation has largely walked away or is, or is hostile to it. And yet mm-hmm. uh, the funny thing is like some of the, my generation has come back to it, uh, mm-hmm. when, you know, um, it, like in a surprising way sometimes. Yeah. And um, well, that was me and my sister. You know, we were not raised in a particularly pious family, but both of us that we were very different religiously. Mm-hmm. We both mm-hmm. went to church and our, even though our parents didn't and, yeah, I mean, I started doing that, like, going to church on your own thing, like, when I was in my teenage years. Like, I I, I, I begged when I was, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old to not go to church. And then by 18, 19, I was going on my own. Yeah. Um, so at some point, they have to they have to apprehend it on their own. And, there's, and I, I think for a lot of us, it's just going to be like, you know we're just going to be like praying and crying alone a lot while they go on their, on their journey and whatever kind of peril and danger they go into, which they, they have to go into uh, in at least internally in their souls or uh, you know, there's uh, one thing I've learned too, is like, I've been part of a traditionalist Catholic community now that developed at, at this parish in Norwalk, Connecticut for 13 years. Um, now we've been going and we have this core of families uh, about our age and we're all the same story for everyone. Like we are the faithful, last faithful node in our larger extended families often. And we're the ones with all the kids. And right, 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 right. Whatever, and we, and we, and it's beautiful. We have these, uh, we're gonna have one this weekend, like these parties where, you know, you get like 10 parents and like there's 30, 40, yeah, 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 50, I love it. 50 kids. I love and it. it's yeah, just yeah. awesome. And finally, like, because you're with these other parents, you all give each other permission to like sit back and relax in a way that you don't get from your neighbors in the Northeast. Oh, I, and, I know, um, I know that one. <laughs> and, um, and it's great. And, you know, and we came together and like one of our, our closest parish friends, they had a really difficult pregnancy recently, trisomy 16, Mm-hmm. Then it turned out it was only the placenta and they already have a lot of children and the, 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 the preemie newborn and the mother ended up in separate hospitals. Um, oh, geez. Oof. And like, we just like my wife just like took over administrating their lives and, and organizing all of these other families to support them through this trial for two months. And it, it was carried off beautifully. But at the same time, like we've also seen during like the COVID era, the stress and strain, like one of our, one of the families that we kind of thought was like part of this core group, like the marriage dissolved and, Mm. you know, one of the members of that marriage is like repudiating the faith basically. Uh, And so it's like, it was like a reminder that we can't create a culture among ourselves that does all the work like like there still will be uh you know if it's a battle there are casualties right right? no i think that's right i think that's right so but you know and that story is not over yet i hope not um but it, it it kind of i don't know it's it's to me kind of going through that and going through coming back to faith itself has kind of made me a little bit easier or or you know uh I don't know, just more willing to accept that uh, whatever God's will is for us, uh, it's going to involve turmoil and uh, heartache. And in a sense, like that's, that's the price of glory, right? Like, well, like I, I, want, I want to live in a Christian age where mm-hmm. it's easy for my children to hang on to the faith and, um, and to turn to its consolations as the inevitable tragedies of living a, a mortal's life yeah. 
get to them. Okay, but that's not our fate. And, you know, uh, maybe my children are going to have a much harder time of it, but they might have a much larger crown of glory in the end. Yeah, I mean, um, insert Tolkien quote here. I mean, we yeah, don't get to choose the time. And I, I you yeah. know, I, I, there's a reason why that, that quotation haunts us all. It's because we know that we're kind of living in one of those those times. And, and casualties are going to be real. And those of us who have to fight these various battles in our various capacities, you know, you all are writers and I teach in the classroom. It's like we're going to bear the wounds of those particular fights. And, 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 and maybe, and, and of course, we, our faith tells us that those are part of the sort of our, our – ultimate glories you know i think too i think that go ahead i think too i think there's a we're also mourning i think the um what was left behind right like because on some level like i began my own career and i thought i understood like the challenge to come and i kind of bet my life in a certain way and now i realize like oh actually this is going to be a much um, like if I had known what the political atmosphere would become like in the United States when I was 24 years old, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what it would be like when I'm 40, mm-hmm. um, I think I would have been a coward and I wouldn't be mm-hmm. where I am now. Wow. And so in a weird way, like I, I kind of, um, like if I had known, like basically like, uh, 10 years of conservative opinion writing and like, you're basically not going to be able to make a livelihood doing anything else. That's not manual labor. If that, if that gig runs out for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's where I am too. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's like, I, you know, I had a conversation with a garage door repairman yesterday. I was like, how much do you make? Should I do that? Yeah. Sorry. Should and I? And it was yeah. like literally like the same that I do. I yeah. Like, yeah. Well, Gee. I, and, but, and, and he's never going to be the subject of, hate pieces and hate pieces or whatever, or, you know, whatever. So, um, or actual live hate, you know? And so, um, and, but anyway, I would have, if I had known where, where we'd be now, I probably would have been a coward when I was 24 and, mm-hmm. and I'm sort of trying to make myself grateful for, uh, mm-hmm. where I'm daring to go. Um, and well, it's, it's interesting you put it like that because uh, just yesterday, as, as we're talking now, just yesterday was a 10 year anniversary of the death of my younger sister from cancer. And uh, that death, my, my wife and I went to the funeral and just seeing the way she was carried to her mm-hmm. death for the, over the 19 months with cancer by the people in our small town made my wife and I decide we needed to move down there to help care for my parents and my family. Yeah. And as I've documented in books, um, it didn't work out. I mean, things went really, really bad for me, for my family. And uh, if I had known that it was going to go so bad, I never would have come down here. On the other hand, uh, the book, the main book I wrote about this was How Dante Can Save Your Life. And uh, through that terrible struggle um, to reconcile myself to my father and uh, by reading Dante, I went on this uh, unanticipated pilgrimage, arduous pilgrimage through my own heart. And I came out of it much, much closer to God because I had always believed and not even realizing what I was doing, that God the Father loved me, but he didn't approve of me. Well, I just projected my own relationship with my dad onto God. And so uh, how can you put a price on that? What kind of suffering is is important or it makes a much deeper loving relationship with almighty God worthwhile. And so I can't, uh, even though I'm still, there's still reverberations going on in my family from my sister's death, even 10 years. Now, I can't say that uh, I regret it because would I have become the the writer I am today? Would I have become the, the Christian I am today, the man I am today without having to deal with this suffering and to wrestle with it as a believer? No, I wouldn't have. And so I, you know, it would have been a much easier life had I stayed on the East Coast. Um, but I, I still can't for all the, the crap I've had to take and I'm still dealing yeah. with. I can't say it was a bad move. Right. I feel like this uh, has been kind of a therapy session for us. This has been kind of, <laughs> well, this has been kind well, of nice, gentlemen. Well, I have, to, I have to say, I know we're coming to our an end here, but we, yeah. you know, we start out talking about, do you go to Hungary? I yeah. think you go to Hungary if it were a place where you could be protected from persecution and the persecution 
was extremely bad back in America. Mm -hmm. But I can't foresee the persecution being so bad that it, I would feel justified in fleeing my own country and fleeing my own people who, and my own family who needed help. Um, the idea, I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of people today don't understand the Benedict option. They don't understand and live not by lies. They think I'm trying to preach a way of avoiding suffering and a way of, of, uh, of getting away from the mm. suffering. And it's not true. What I'm trying to do, and I've been as explicit as I can, is tell people, look, this is coming. There's no way to get out of this. But what we can do is meet it with as much faith and resilience as we can muster. But we're not going to have that faith and resilience if we just sit back and wait for it to happen. We, there are things we can and should do right now to make us more resilient. And, and Michael is right that you can't, our, our kids aren't robots. We can't program them to be right. Christian. But I love this quote from the Harvard philosopher, Elaine Scarry. I've used it on my, my uh, Substack recently. She said, the purpose of education is to get people, get your students to be staring at the right place in the sky when the comet goes by. That's and I great. think that's true about God, yeah. too, and about preparing our kids uh, for the life life in Christ, is that uh, you can't force them to be Christian, but you can arrange them and form them in such a way that they're staring at the sky when the comet goes by. And for me, the comet went by first in the Cathedral of Chartres when I was 17 mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. and it kept going by until I finally hitched a ride on it. Right, yeah. It's beautifully said. You yeah, know, it's... Yeah. It's funny too, you know, I think um, I had a fun kind of rip roaring debate with my own father recently about faith and he was kind of just, he and, and one of my half sisters were kind of probing, you know, where are you coming from with all this? What do you really think? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, why, you know, why do you think this? And, you know, kind of giving me all the kind of usual moral scripts and challenges that, you know, of today. Sure. And, um, and my, my father had been raised by a very devout father um you know my father can describe like in detail you know they lived in a two up two down in uh, a housing development in dublin um kind of like famously it, it, like there's two famous developments like this donnie carney and crumlin and um you know he had he had five siblings and you know he and his brother slept in the same bedroom as their parents and like his father would pray a family rosary with all the family and then would climb into bed with his wife. And then they, they'd pray a rosary. He'd lead a rosary with her right after. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, he kind of would like, was always checking in on all these religious orders that were operating in Dublin and kind of, um, you know, super active to the point where when he, uh, where my grandfather, who I never met, um, when he kind of went into his dementia in his old age and, and had to be in a care home, uh, the nurses would have to wash him. And, you know, all he had was he had his sense of modesty. So he would like mm -hmm. struggle mm -hmm. with them over this. And then they learned the only way to get him to be at peace was to start praying mm -hmm. a, a Hail Mary or start praying mm -hmm. in our father. And he would just like instantly fall into praying the rosary and calm mm -hmm. down. Wow. And to me, that's like, <laughs> that's amazing. But there's probably something, there's probably something perverted about it, but to me, like yeah. that's the ultimate image of faith. No, it's in, perfect. In a way, is it's to perfect. have lost everything, but, yeah. but God. And, um, and yet, like, I know, like, uh, you know, but then at the same time, my, my father also would have grown up in Ireland of the fifties, sixties and early seventies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, seen all of these like injustices you know our team this famous industrial school where the children were abused yeah not just in extraordinary ways sexually by priests but like just the normal just in common ways yeah, of like yeah. you're a poor yeah you're the poor son of scum and i'm mm -hmm. a good priest mm -hmm. uh and i'm gonna lord it over you mm -hmm. day to day he would have seen that um although he didn't go to our team thank god um and that's all in him too. And, and for him, I think only now that the church is totally prostrate Defen in Ireland yeah, yeah. is he sort of, there's some little thing in his heart that is 
you know, just makes him curious. Like he doesn't believe yet, but once it's a total underdog, once it's totally destroyed, he, he thinks it would be more attracted to him at that but point. Once it's no longer a threat to him. I mean, this is for yeah. me, the, how I helped, how I regained the care I had for the, uh, and the love I had for the Catholic Church. Once I no longer felt responsible for the bishops and no longer after I left the Catholic Church and once I no longer felt that they were a threat to my children, then I was able to see the good again. But gosh, that's another podcast. And here we are at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. You ought to come so, back on. Come back on and let's talk about religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah religion. no, no, we should do that. That'd be fun. Um, we were talking about religion in a way. But, yeah. But All right, we, well, look, yeah. look, you know. But I'm uh, getting, I keep getting the question, you know, hey, you just criticized uh, all this papology. Why aren't why aren't you Eastern Orthodox yet? And uh, God, we, we, I would love to do a, a nine hour podcast with you about <laughs> this, Michael. But maybe our audience does not. But at any rate, I, I want to just thank you for coming on. You are our sure. officially our first. Um, this is our first uh, guest with both Rod and I present. We had Ross uh, a few months back, but it was just me. Sadly, we had some tech failures. So anyway, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank uh, you. We, we could keep doing this for hours, uh, but but we'll have to have you back. Uh, right, so cool. so Rod, why don't you send us off, brother? Don't get nothing on you. <laughs>